Our reading this morning is from the second chapter of the book of Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's a real joy and honor to be worshiping with you today, and I want to thank Pastor Leon for inviting me to come and preach. Uh, I've certainly known this congregation for a number of years, uh, have worshiped here on occasion. Uh, your former pastor, Pastor Larry Kassenbaum, I met 42 years ago when I was new into ministry, and so had a relationship with him a long time as well. But it, it is a delight to be here with you. About 20 years ago or so, uh, Bill Bennett wrote a book called The Book of Virtues. Maybe some of you read that book. It's about yay thick. And he was lamenting the fact that virtues aren't being taught anymore. We seem to have lost many important virtues in our culture. Well, this morning I want to talk about one of those virtues. It's very biblical, a, a very important virtue in the Bible, and it's humility. In the book of James, we read these words, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I think you would agree with me that we are living in some very tumultuous times, a lot of division in our, in our culture, in our land. And I think a little humility would go a long ways towards having some civil discourse. And I also think it's important for us to humble ourselves before God, repent of our sins, and plead for divine protection for our nation, a nation we love, we, and to be humble in doing that. People often wonder what humility means or what is the definition of humility. Well, I'm sure there's different ones, but in the Bible, humility or humbleness is the quality of being courteous and respectful of others. It's the opposite of pride and arrogance. Rather than me first, humility is, friend, you go first. And humility is a recognition of our dependence upon God. Humility is a virtue as a major theme in both the Old and New Testaments. It's because humility is exactly what we need if we're going to have peace and harmony in our relationships with others. Humility allows us to see the dignity and the worth of others who are created by God. And humility distinguishes the wise leader from that one who's arrogant and seeking only power. <clears throat> in the first century, uh, public honor was the highest virtue. And because of that, and it, it was an honor-shame culture, so you want to have honor. Because of that, boasting became uh, something that was very common. And it was almost an art to learn how to boast. And this boasting also infected uh, converts to Christianity before they became Christians. And so you'll notice in numerous New Testament letters, the writers talk about having a humble spirit and the importance of humility. Boasting was an art form. And if somebody could shame somebody else, well, that was all the better. Greatness was determined by one's power and position. Much like what happens in Washington, D.C., people jockeyed for power and position, 
And if they had to des destroy somebody in pursuit of more power and a higher position, well, so be it. Boasting of their own position and blaming others when things went wrong, that was understood as a way to receive greatness and to attain greatness. Well, something happened in the first century that changed the attitude of many, many people. And what I'm about to describe is a huge shift in their culture in that first century. And here's what happened. The virtue of humility became respected and was moved to a place of great importance. Well, how did that happen? What was the event? Well, the Christians of the first century, best exemplified by Paul in his letter, second chapter of Philippians, declared that Almighty God humbled himself in human form. In the man, Jesus of Nazareth, he humbled himself. He humbled himself on a cross, even to the point of death. These Christians said, if we're to boast, we're not going to boast about ourselves, but we're going to boast about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And so the crucifixion of Jesus was the event that redefined greatness. Crucifixion was the ultimate punishment. Those who were crucified they were the lowest of the low in the Roman world. Not only was it physically excruciating, but it was shameful to be left on a cross to die. People would gather around and they would taunt the person being crucified. So the cross posed a massive problem for those first Christians. Did his crucifixion mean that Jesus was not as great as they thought he was, or did it mean they had to refine, redefine greatness in light of the cross? And those early Christians chose to redefine what greatness means. And their reasoning was this. If the greatest man they had ever known had been willing to be sacrificed on a cross, then greatness must consist in willing sacrifice. This understanding of humility has profoundly affected the Western civilization. However, I wonder sometimes if we've lost sight of the importance of this virtue of humility in the 21st century. Now, I know we haven't lost total sight of it, but I think for many people, and many in our culture, humility is an old-fashioned, outdated, and maybe even disdained virtue. In many parts of society, I think humility is scorned. My dad was a football and a baseball coach. And when I was growing up, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. He'd say, Steve, when you lose, you say little. And when you win, you say less. <laughs> Boy, that was pounded into me. Bragging and boasting were not to be tolerated. And I can tell you this, if my dad were still alive, and if he were watching a football game, and one of the wide receivers scored a touchdown and took the ball and spiked it and did a dance and then taunted his opponents... I hear what my dad would say, he'd say, why does he just give the ball to the referee and act like he's been there before? <laughs> you know, boasting and bragging, that's not what it's all about. Now, my dad had an old school mentality of humility, and it was this, you do the best job you can do, you don't show anybody up, and then you move on to the next challenge. He was all about celebrating accomplishments but not at somebody else's expense. One can have a sense of pride, but you can still remain humble. Let me talk for a moment what humility is not. Humility is not humiliation. Humility does not mean that you let people walk all over you. Humility does not mean that you degrade yourself or let others degrade you. Humility does not mean that you don't set some boundaries. And maybe you have been humiliated. Probably all of us have experienced humiliation one time or another. And we know this, humiliation is destructive and it's harmful to the soul. It leads to embarrassment, shame, and a loss of dignity. But that is not humility, that's humiliation. Humility is a choice that builds others up and does not tear down. Humility is also not low self-esteem. Many of us struggle with low self-esteem, but that's not humility. It's not low self-regard. It's not convincing yourself that you're good for nothing. And maybe somebody told you that and you believe it, but that's not humility. 
I love the story about Martin Luther who, if you know anything about his early life, he was very fearful of God because he didn't know how he could please God. And so when he became a monk, he did all the disciplines he thought he should do of fasting and praying, confessing, and he'd do it for days on end. And he would abase himself, and he believed he was lower than a worm. One time, one of his confessors said to him, or one of the people he confessed to said to him, Luther, you know what your problem is? You think you can out the grace of God. Luther was thinking by having such low self-esteem he'd be, that somehow he'd please God that way. And really it was a false sense of pride. He thought he could out God's grace. I just love that. You and I cannot out the grace of God. And so Luther finally discovered that was really pride. It was later that he discovered God's grace and the humility that went with that. Low self-esteem is not humility. In fact, it's contrary to what God says about you. Listen to this. God says that you and I are crowned with glory and honor. Psalm 8. God says you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's in Psalm 139. And God says that we are his workmanship. That's found in Ephesians chapter 2. You may suffer from low self-esteem or low self-regard, That's not how God sees you, and we can't confuse that for humility. Humility is also not hiding your talents. The talents God has given to you are to be used for his glory. God wants us to develop those talents. He wants him to use them. He certainly does not want us to hide them. Jesus said this, Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, Jesus is not talking about boasting here in ourselves, but he's saying use the talents and the gifts you've had to serve others. And that will please God and glorify God. And Paul wrote this, Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Now, as I said, I've, I've known this congregation from afar, not that far away, but from afar, But what I do know about this congregation is that it is filled with people with great talents who are using those talents in service of God's kingdom. I've watched you from afar, and I've seen how this church has planted other churches. What a gift that has been. A year ago, I was invited to go to Christ the Victor, a church you planted, to preach. What a marvelous congregation that is. God gave you the vision, you followed through, you used your talents, and it happened. I know you're making an impact in this community through the use of your talents, and you have a global presence in mission. And I'm sure you don't boast about what you're doing, but here's what I think you probably boast about. Look what God is doing through us. God is doing that. So thank you for using the talents that God gave you and continue to boast in what he is doing through you. John Dixon wrote a book on humility and he described humility this way. He said, humility is a noble choice to forgo your status and to use your influence for the good of others before yourself. That sounds like a description of Jesus, doesn't it? Do do you remember that story when Jesus is walking down a road with his disciples, a dirty, dusty road, and they're arguing with one another? What were they arguing about? Who is the greatest? Jesus must just shook his head. Will they ever get it? (laughs) Well, later, he demonstrated humility as he washed their dirty feet. And Jesus showed to them what humility is. He forgo for his status and he used his influence for the good of his disciples. Another time, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And what did the Pharisees like to do? They liked to boast about their own righteousness before God. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, guys, tax collectors and prostitutes will get into heaven before you will. Why is that? Because they were willing to humble themselves, to admit their sin, and ask Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus' example of humility had a huge influence on his disciples. 
Peter learned the lesson well. Here's what he wrote. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time. Boastful Peter. He was the one who liked to boast, liked to stick his foot in his mouth. But Peter learned from his master humility. The late Reverend John Claypool wrote that at one time in his life, he lived out in the Southwest. I'm not sure where, but he lived out here. And he wanted to learn about stagecoaches. And he discovered some things that he didn't know. He discovered that when you bought a ticket for a stagecoach, you could get a first class, second class, or a third class ticket. Of course, first class is more expensive, but everybody traveled in the same space. But if there was a problem that happened, if you bought a first class ticket, you didn't have to get out of the stagecoach. You could stay right there. If you had a second class ticket, if a problem happened, you had to get out and walk along as, as the stagecoach was being repaired. And if you had a third class ticket, you had to get out and you had to help with the repair. Even if that meant you know, getting down in dirt and mud, getting all dirty, your job was to help out. And obviously that was a less prestigious ticket to have. Well, then Claypool wrote this. He said, when I first learned of this practice of the stagecoach, I remember thinking that this is reflective of our human nature, namely to equate the category of first class with privilege and being exempt from having to do the most menial kind of work. And at the same time, it dawned on me how radically uh, different Jesus' hierarchy of values are. When he came to live upon the earth, he gave a very different interpretation of that metaphor of first class. Not long ago, I spoke with a group of men and the, the topic turned to this virtue of humility and here are some of the things this group of men said. And I think their insights are spot on. One person said, it's easy to get a big head. Lack of humility can get you into all kinds of trouble. Another person said, Humility is giving other people the opportunity to shine. Another man said, the secret to success is that the higher you move up, the more humble you must become. Another one had this insight. Arrogance turns people away from Christianity. Man, we don't want to be arrogant disciples. Another person said, forever and ever we want significance, but our significance comes from God. I'm sure many of you read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, when it came out years ago. A lot of great uh, teaching in that book. But one line I remember was this. He wrote these, these words. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Well, I know that all of us want to feel important. We're wired up that way. We want we have this sense of importance that we want to have met and a sense of significance. And, and, and I think that's okay, but the problem is we can let that part of our human nature get out of control. And when that sense of importance get out of, gets out of control, it can damage other relationships. Has there ever been a time when you were, you were slighted by some, at least you thought you were being slighted by somebody? And you thought, okay, which way are we gonna go with this relationship? You know, maybe you get, let that sense of self-importance get out of control. Well, I think when those times happen, it's really important for us to manage that relationship by going to humility. Before damaging our relationship, check to see, maybe I'm letting my self-importance get too out of control. I need to go back to humility. You know, and sometimes it's hard to hear that, to hear what the Bible teaches because it challenges the way we think and the way we act. But this virtue of humility is really important in the scriptures, and it's a way to have peace and harmony in relationships. Now let me share with you some of the benefits of humility. Humility is a virtue that's needed as disciples of Christ. Jesus wants us to be his disciples. He wants us to follow him, and he wants us to learn from him. And as a disciple of Jesus, we represent him to the world. As one person said, for some people, you might be the only Jesus anybody ever meets. So as his disciples, we want to represent him well. The apostle Paul discovered that humility 
is important for a disciple. Listen to these words, again, written in second, or Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Well, we could stop there and have a sermon just right there, couldn't we? But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. There's so much we could unpack right there and a lot we'd struggle with right there. But Paul learned that virtue of humility. And how did he learn that? Let's go to the next part. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. As I mentioned earlier, it was the crucifixion of Jesus, which was the greatest example of humility the world had ever witnessed. It was his death on the cross that made humility a virtue that's been practiced by Christians for the past 2,000 plus years. It's Christ's humility that motivates his church to humbly serve the people around us and be a benefit to the society we live in. Because our Lord humbled himself, we are called to put others' interests ahead of our own as a sign that Jesus Christ reigns in our lives. Is it easy? No, it's not. Our flesh protests against it often. Do we forget to do this? Oh yeah, we forget all the time because that inflated sense of self-importance wants to grab hold of us all the time. However, we are disciples. We are representative of Jesus and we want to become more and more like him. Humility also generates new knowledge. Listen to these words from Psalm 25. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his ways. We often talk, often talk about somebody who is a, a good learner. We say they have a teachable spirit. This is a person who realizes that he or she does not know it all. And they're humble enough to admit that, and they seek the help of others. And just think of all the knowledge that's been generated because people have been humbled and want to learn from somebody else who knew more than they did. You know, humility is a realization that there's a big world out there and we don't know it all. And when we're humble, we can grow. I'm sure in this congregation there are some teachers or, or coaches who've had some really talented kids that probably didn't reach potential you thought they would reach. Maybe because they weren't humble. And then you had some kids who weren't as talented, but they were humble. They wanted to learn. They were curious. They wanted to get better. And their success exceeded those of their peers who were more talented. Humility generates new knowledge, new skill that we might realize our potential. Humility is also inspiring. Listen to about Moses here. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more, than, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Moses is one of the heroes of the Old Testament. Moses is a key, key figure in the Old Testament. And what characterizes Moses? Well, according to the numbers here, he was humble. Now, this does not mean he was a pushover. Moses is no pushover. He was tough when he needed to be. He got angry when it was appropriate to express anger. But his obedience was seen, or his humility was seen in his, in his obedience to God. Moses had the toughest assignment in the whole world. He was to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. And for 40 years, what did he have to put up with? Complaining and grumbling. This wasn't right, that wasn't right. The people wanted a different God. They built, a, you know, the, the golden calf. They wanted a different leader. They wanted to fire Moses and get somebody else. Moses must have just, what, Lord, are we going to do with these people? And I wonder if he said to God one time, he said, Lord, these people are beneath me. I'm better than they are. Come on, let's start over. Let's get a new group of people, and then we'll get to the promised land. I'm sure he was tempted, but Moses didn't do that. No, with a humble spirit, he led the Israelites, and here's what he did. He trusted God, that God knew exactly what he was doing. It has been said, when great leaders are humble, we don't just admire them, we aspire to be like them. And finally, humility 
pleases God. Again, let's listen to Peter. All of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Peter learned humility from Jesus. He didn't start out humble, or, uh, humble but he learned to how to be humble. And what he discovered in his humility before God was that when you're humble before God, God opens the floodgates to receive his blessings and grace. You know, when we put pride in our self-dependence, you know, I can do it all, I don't need God, God's just a crutch, we miss out on the blessings and the grace that God has for us. But when we humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your strength. I need your help just to get through this day. When we humble ourselves before God, he pours those blessings and that grace and his strength into our lives. The late Tony Snow wrote his thoughts about death shortly before he died, death and life. And here's one of the things he wrote. He didn't brag about his own accomplishments, but here's what he wrote. There is nothing wilder than a life of humble virtue, for it is through selflessness and service that God wrings from our bodies and spirits the most we could ever give, the most we could ever offer, and the most we could ever do. God wrings from us the most potential we have if we're willing to be humble and offer ourselves to God. Well, whatever happened to humility? Well, I think humility is still around and amongst many people, but I also think, in large part, the world scorns humility. But may it be said about us, God's church, it is live and it is well and it is practiced by the followers of Jesus, and they are abounding in God's grace. Amen.